Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for the Ask the Experts webinar series. Before we get started, I'm going to share some housekeeping items for today's webinar. Everyone on the call will remain muted for the duration of the webinar. At the end of the webinar, we will open the floor for live Q&A. We encourage you to ask questions and you can submit your questions at any time using the chat box feature in the Zoom platform. If you would like to ask your question live, simply click on the raise your hand button and we will unmute you during the Q&A portion. Today's webinar, we will be focusing on a multidisciplinary approach involving modern wound care and vascular strategies. We are joined by Dr. Mark Lesney and Dr. Allison Garten. Dr. Mark Lesney is a vascular and interventional radiologist at Vascular and Interventional Specialist of Charlotte Radiology, where he focuses on the evaluation and treatment of patients with peripheral artery disease, critical limb ischemia, complex lower extremity, and thoracic venous disease. Dr. Lesney participated in the combined undergraduate and medical school program at Boston University, studying mathematics, chemistry, and theater arts, and subsequently obtaining his medical doctorate. He completed his radiology residency and vascular and interventional radiology fellowship at Duke University, serving as chief resident. Dr. Lesney was assistant professor of radiology at Johns Hopkins Medical Institute, where he still holds an adjunct faculty appointment and is a fellow of the Society of Interventional Radiology. He is the author of over 30 peer-reviewed publications and multiple book chapters. Dr. Lesney currently resides in Charlotte, North Carolina with his wife and three children. Dr. Allison Garten is a board certified podiatric surgeon and certified podorthist. She received her BS in biology at East Carolina University and completed her doctorate of podiatric medicine at Temple University School of Podiatric Medicine. Dr. Garten completed her residency at Washington Hospital Center and Georgetown University Hospital in Washington, DC. She's a wound care panel physician at Tenet Hospital at Piedmont Medical Center and a wound care consultant for several companies and professional speaker on wound care and limb salvage. Dr. Garten was recently named one of the most influential podiatrists by Podiatric Management Magazine. She currently lives in Charlotte, North Carolina and in her spare time, she enjoys spending time with her husband and two-year-old daughter. Her life motto is, your health is your wealth. I'm now gonna pass it over to Dr. Garten to begin the presentation. Thank you, Alexa. And thank you everybody for joining us today. This presentation will take you know, about 45 minutes, but feel free to connect with us at the end of the presentation if you have a case you'd like to discuss or even connect with us afterwards. So let's go ahead and get started. So there's no shortage of wounds in the US and the numbers are only continuing to grow. As people are living longer, they're more likely to develop comorbidities such as diabetes, coronary artery disease, and renal disease, which puts them at a high risk of developing a wound. And did you know that one in 38 people will develop an ulcer in their lifetime? So these are pictures of just some of my patients who I've treated in the past. Most were referred after having the wound for several months and several modalities attempted. The others were told the only thing left that could be done is a below knee amputation. Did you know that the five year mortality rate for a diabetic ulcer is higher than the five most common cancers? So in general, a sooner a patient is referred to a wound care specialist, the sooner we can prevent amputation, limb loss and life loss. So wounds are complicated, we all know this. It truly takes a multidisciplinary approach to care. And you can see here all the specialists that are typically involved from the wound care specialist, along with the wound care nurses. And I'm lucky to have four dedicated wound care nurses who work with me at the wound care center. Without them, it would be impossible to care for these complicated patients. We also need a vascular limb specialist, either a vascular surgeon or an interventional radiologist, not just any vascular doctor, but one who specializes in limb salvage. We need an infectious disease doctor and you can see the other specialists that are needed in, in order to take care of these complicated patients. So all these specialists play a vital role in the healing of a wound. And we know if we focus only on the wound itself and did not treat the underlying etiologies as well, it'd be unlikely these ulcers would heal. So there are a lot of advanced wound care modalities out there. You can't just use gauze and neosporin to treat these patients. They'll fail, 
the wound will progress and they'll have a high likelihood of limb loss. Just with the wound care dressings alone, there are eight different product categories based on the amount of extate, the amount of granulation tissue present, the tissue integrity. So it's really complicated to determine the right wound care modality for your patient. So I often use cellular tissue products or skin grafts routinely if a patient's wound is granular. It's pretty rare nowadays to use an autograph. Instead, we use human stem cell grafts, neonatal foreskin grafts, porcine grafts, avian grafts. There's even fish skin grafts out there. So there's about 65 of these out on the market currently. But when I was in my residency, there were only two. So you can clearly see there's a demand for new products daily because a number of wounds are only continuing to grow. We'll often use negative pressure wound therapy. We'll use collagens, offloading devices. And there's a lot of newer technology that's coming out on a daily basis. So for the initial visit, every patient's wound is debrided if, if it's indicated to assist in removing this non-viable necrotic tissue. We also use advanced wound care dressings and treatment modalities are ordered on that first visit. A full workup is performed, including labs and imaging. ABIs are done on that initial visit to determine what the baseline arteria supply. And be aware though, sometimes we actually get a normal ABI on a patient, but the patient has a long history of diabetes, the patient might have a long history of heart disease, the patient may be a smoker. So we can't just focus on what the results of this ABI test is. You know, we have to really look at the patient as a whole and if you feel there's a level of concern of peripheral arterial disease, you know, very quick to refer these patients out. Offloading devices, especially when we're dealing with these diabetic plantar foot wounds. Home health orders is written if needed and supplies are sent to the patient's home. And then referrals, referrals. You know, if a patient has an abnormal arterial supply or we suspect it, patients are referred to a vascular on day one. Also could be the PCP and infectious disease. So you can see why it is important to have a dedicated staff of nurses whose area of expertise is wound care to assist with these complicated patients. So let's go over my first case. So this is a 57 year old family, female who presented with a right plantar fifth metatarsal wound um, that had been present about three months. She stated it started after a blister popped. So this is a pretty uh, common presentation of these diabetic neuropathic wounds. You know, the smallest amount of friction or micro trauma to the skin can cause ulcerations without the patient being aware. Remember, they're neuropathic. So you can see here the past medical history and all these comorbidities listed are very common in the wound care population. And so on day one, a full workup was performed. So initial in treatment included ABI, so the non-invasive non vascular testing, which was surprising enough was normal. Um, she wasn't a smoker. She's a, a younger, um, on the younger side from a diabetic standpoint and her wound actually looked pretty granular. So my level of suspicion for having PAD was low. Uh, we did order a enzymatic debriding agent to remove this non-viable uh, tissue present. We ordered advanced dressings and an offloading boot along with x-rays to evaluate the depth. So this is what the wound looked like on her initial visit on 9-2, September 2nd of last year. So we saw the patient weekly. And unfortunately, a few days after the second picture, that picture you see to the right, the patient ended up in the ER with an infected wound. These wounds can worsen quickly because there's so many factors involved. Did the patient walk on the foot? Did her sugars go up? It's so hard to say, but that's the reason there's such an urgency in treating these patients aggressively on day one. Remember, her wound had already been present for three months. So in the hospital, she received a fifth ray amputation. So the fifth digit and the fifth metatarsal were amputated. So this is what her foot looked like when she returned to clinic. She was started on negative pressure wound therapy to, to help and assist in creating more granulation tissue. We use compression wraps to help control her edema and we continue with the offloading boot. And you can see here how the wound has progressed from December 18th uh, to the end of December. So her wound continued to improve and on January 6th, we discontinued the use of negative pressure 
and we were, got approval by insurance for application of a skin substitute. So we did do two applications of a human stem cell product, which was applied on January 13th and January 20th. But now see how nicely that wound is progressing. So from that point on, the wound actually progressed extremely fast. So on February 17th, we discontinued the use of using a stem cell product and we applied a collagen to the wound bed along with making sure the patient is offloading as much as possible and making sure we're monitoring that edema. So you can really look at how edematous that foot is. So we did use three layer compression wraps on her and really focused on educating her on elevation, 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 and just trying to stay off this foot as much as possible. So she was discharged on March, or on March 17th, so about one week ago from the wound care center. But if we just discharged her and did not educate her on continuing to offload her foot, the wound would likely reopen. The tissue needs time to mature. So she'll continue with a foam dressing until she receives diabetic shoes and custom inserts from her podiatrist. So which specialists were involved with this patient's care? Myself, the wound care specialist, the primary care physician to assist in managing the other, assist in managing the diabetes and her other comorbidities, the surgeon, the surgeon uh, in this case was an orthopedic surgeon, but typically it's a podiatric surgeon uh, such as myself who specializes in, in limb salvage, um, who, who's performed the fifth ray amputation. Infectious disease doctor was involved who treated the patient with IV antibiotics during her hospitalization. It compliance by the patient are vital in the healing of this patient. Advanced wound care modality. We talked about the amyloid we talked about the enzymatic to remove that non -vibe. We also use a negative pressure wound therapy. We use a skin substitute, collagen, compression dressings, foam dressings, SAP dressings. So there's a lot that goes into the healing of a wound, as you can see. So this is another case of mine. Uh, this is a patient, a 74-year-old female that presented saying that a cat scratched her leg in August of last year. Uh, she was initially treated by her PCP with uh, antibiotics. And you can take a look at her past medical history here. She has a documented history of PAD um, and she also has a documented history of coronary artery disease. So, you know, we know we were already dealing with a lower extremity that had um, arterial issues. And from her social history, she's a long, long time smoker. And of course we educate her on day one about stopping, which is not an easy thing to do, as you know. So this is what her left leg looked like on her initial visit. The wound was 2.5 by two by 0.4. But as you can now see in the second picture, now that the eschar and this non-vital tissue was removed, the wound truly, the size of the wound truly reveals itself to, in this picture. And her initial treatment included ABIs, which were non-compressible. So we knew we had this, she had this documented history of PAD and was a smoker. So we knew the likelihood of her needing some type of intervention was high to assist in her healing. We use enzymatic debriding agent to remove this yellow non-viable tissue. And you can see that in that second picture. We use advanced drainage dressings to manage her exudate aggressively. And on day one, we referred her to a vascular limb specialist, specifically an interventional radiologist, Dr. Lesney, for evaluation. So Dr. Lesney, I'm gonna let you take it from here. Thanks, Dr. Garden. that was great. Um, so I'm actually going to share my screen here. And hopefully you can see this. Um, this is exactly the patient that Dr. Garden was talking about. And so when we see this patient, the first thing we do is get non-invasive studies. Now, Dr. Garden mentioned this, ABIs are important. But in the world of limb salvage and critical limb ischemia, ABIs are completely insufficient. And I'll show some examples of that as well. And the reason is what we care about not only is perfusion to the limb, but as limb salvage specialists, vascular specialists, we want perfusion to the foot, to the toe. And so we rely somewhat heavily on uh, toe pressures as well. So not only did this patient have bad um, ankle brachial indices, but actually her pressure to her toes were pretty abysmal. So she had poor limb flow all the way down. And so 
in this patient, clearly she needs increased perfusion. And so this generally starts with an arteriogram with the idea of not only evaluating what her arterial status is, but also treating her. And you can see this is a picture of her uh, abdomen. So there's the aorta, iliac arteries. This is her leg on the right. And in fact, she is missing her entire superficial femoral artery. Now that said, she has a very good deep femoral artery in her thigh. Again, we will continue our evaluation all the way down to the tip of her toes. And so this is her knee. And in fact, her tibial arteries are okay. Her runoff all the way to her plantar, medial and lateral plantar arteries to her feet weren't that bad. And so for us, when I look at this patient, I say, okay, what, is, what do I need to do for this patient? The right procedure for the right patient. So what we decided is let's treat her iliac and her common femoral arteries. And that should give enough perfusion to her leg, even without an SFA. And so that's what we did. We were able to open her up, uh, her common femoral, and actually get a nice tube here. And then if you look at a month follow-up, you could see not only did her ABIs increase, but look at her toe pressures. So her flow all the way down to her toes increased from 34 to 122 millimeters of mercury. And we really want a value above 35 to 55. And so here, she should have more than enough perfusion. But as I tell all my patients, I can give you all the blood flow in the world. It is irrelevant unless you have the magic of a wound care specialist. And that's where a multidisciplinary team uh, comes into play. And that's exactly what I did. Handed her back to Dr. Garden for her to work her magic. And you'll see what she did here. So this patient is now um, with the, the first picture you see to your left is nine day status post uh, her endovascular procedure. And you're really beginning to see that pinpoint bleeding now that the patient is getting the proper blood flow to the lower extremity. And on that picture you see on January 6, now that the wound is 100% granular, um, we can now be almost, we almost need to be even more aggressive at this point in treating the patient. Next slide. So at this point, we've went ahead when the wound was 100% granular, we started applying a stem cell skin substitute. Um, and we actually applied a total of eight stem cell substitutes on this patient. And you can see how the wound is now decreasing. The wound's 100% granular. Um, it's, just, uh, it's just a beautiful looking wound. So this is a six application and the wound continues to improve and decrease in size. Continue. And then this is a final uh, application of the skin substitute. I mean, you know, the wound is so small at this point, but we can't just stop treatment at this point. We need to continue. So on the next slide, you'll see that we actually, even though the wound is so small, we continued with the collagen at this point, because we know if we just decide to discharge the patient or we decide to stop treatment, this wound's just going to open right back up. So we did use a collagen. We continued with compression with this patient. And uh, actually yesterday was um, her, she actually 100% healed her wound, um, but we did talk to her long-term about treatment because right now this skin is very immature. So we have to continue to protect it. She has to continue to stop smoking. She's got to continue to do the right things or this wound is likely just to reopen. Next slide. So what was needed? You can clearly see everything that was needed um, with the treatment of this patient. So really having you know, the right team involved whose area of expertise is limb salvage on day one is vital to these wounds healing and vital to these patients getting back to a better quality of life. I'm gonna turn it back to you, Dr. Lesney. Thank you. So I'm gonna actually discuss a, a third patient now. Uh, this is a patient of mine. It's a 57 year old gentleman with uh, diabetes, neuropathy, unfortunate ongoing tobacco use. He has a history of a third toe ulcer and osteomyelitis. And unfortunately, this is not responding to IV or PO antibiotics. He is in and out of wound care. He is in and out of the hospital. To complicate things matter further, um, here is his past history. He's had a history of a fem-fem bypass because he had an acute limb ischemia, I think it was eight or 10 years ago. He's already been treated through an endovascular SFA stent that has since chronically occluded. He went for a fem-pop bypass that is now chronically occluded. He had a revision of that bypass, which is now chronically occluded. And in the past, he's already lost his first and second toe because of ulcers. So clearly a very, very high risk individual. And on top of things to make matters worse, his hemoglobin A1C is out of whack. Here's an example of his MRI. You could see uh, increased signal. He clearly has osteomyelitis of his uh, third toe. Again, non-responsive to antibiotics. So he was referred to a vascular specialist, not me. 
And here's what the note says. It is my opinion that he would not heal a toe amputation. He is not a candidate for yet another third time redo bypass. And therefore, we recommend below knee amputation. Unhappy with that, uh, he was referred to a second vascular specialist who said, therefore, I have recommended right below knee amputation. Um, now, these are very good vascular specialists. And in fact, if you look at the patient, you know, he's got this very long segment stent in the SFA that's been down for years. You could see in the background, he has this bypass conduit that's been down for years. This is a very complicated patient. And so recommending amputation is not unreasonable. And I would venture to say in the vast majority of cases nationwide, that is what this patient would get, a below knee amputation. The problem is critical limb ischemia really does require a multidisciplinary team. It requires wound care specialists, orthopedists, endocrinologists, podiatrists, primary care providers, and vascular specialists, limb salva specialists. Unfortunately, it often looks like this. And so while those two vascular specialists clearly were doing what they thought was best for the patient, it was in isolation. And so the patient refused again and was referred to a third vascular specialist. In this case, it was yours truly. And so the first thing I did was get on the phone with the primary care doctor and the um, critical and the uh, uh, wound care specialist. And I said, look, here's what I have to offer. What do you think? Do you think it's even worthwhile from your standpoint? Let's put our heads together, see what we can do to save this person's limb. And we all got together and we said, you know what, let's, let's see what each of us can do and then what we can do as a team. So when I saw the patient, the first thing I did was um, treat him as a whole. And what I mean by that is patients don't die from amputation. Patients die from heart attack and stroke. So it's important not to miss the forest for the trees. So we talked about heart attack and stroke, smoking cessation, antiplatelet agents, statin therapies, and clearly a big focus was on the cigarettes. And the line I use is at some point, we're going to have to decide whether you want to keep your cigarettes or your leg, because it can't be both. And I think I'm very direct with my patients, and I think my patients deserve that. And so ultimately, we decided to proceed with a revascularization. Now, for this, it is generally not useful to revascularize an occluded bypass. And so I decided I'm going to open up a, a native uh, SFA, the SFA that he had that's been chronically occluded. And so I started by... Um, with an angiogram, you can see he's got this sort of common femoral artery that goes nowhere. And we tried to cross it from above and try to cross this blockage. Unfortunately, it wasn't possible because we just went in and out of that stent that had been there for years. Now that said, as a limb salvage vascular expert on these patients, we have to offer them more than just, well, can't do it, let's quit. And so for these patients, we can actually stick the foot and go backwards. And so that's what I did. I actually directly accessed, accessed the anterior tibial artery. This is their foot right here. And in doing this, I was able to successfully cross that chronic years old blockage from below. And you can see here is a wire being thread through that long segment chronically occluded stent. And then I used a uh, device, again, this is all through a small hole in the artery, uh, no open surgery, and was able to open up, uh, take a, a lot of that plaque and open up that stent. And so by the time I finished that part, here's what we have. We've got this beautiful tube blood flow all the way down this is the thigh, this is the leg, or excuse me, the um, uh, upper uh, knee, and then this is the leg. And again, all the way down. Now the problem is that addresses all the blood flow to the ankle. But again, to, to heal these wounds, we have to do more. We have to treat below ankle disease. And if your limb salvage vascular experts aren't doing this, then I think there's room for improvement. And so for these patients, we have to get blood flow where the wound is. And so that's exactly what I did. I was able to, um, after we opened all that, was able, this is the patient's foot, was able to thread a wire and a catheter all the way down around the loop of the foot. And you'll see my wire coming down through all these little arteries around. This is sort of the forefoot. This is the midfoot. This is the heel going backwards and then up the other side, get lost a little bit there, redirect and up the other side. And in doing this, we can actually treat the arteries all the way around the foot to get blood flow all the way down. And this was the final run to his foot. And you can see blood flow going all the way down to the very tip of his foot, his forefoot here. And so we have now restored inline flow all the way down. And that was great. I was very happy. He had a palpable dorsalis pedis pulse. His ulcer was in the toe. And so I was very happy with this. Now, obviously that's not enough. The key and the gold is in the follow-up. 
Um, so the key point is we got to continue wound care. I sent him back to his excellent wound care doctor um, and said, you know, let, let's stick to this together. I saw him back uh, at a month and then every six weeks after that until the wound heals. Obviously his wound care doctor was seeing him more often and we were in communication. I would text and halo and call his primary care doctor and say, you know, what's going on? Is, you know, hemoglobin A1C better? Are we all on the same page? Communication really is key. So on follow-up, he did have that third toe amputation. I started him on antiplatelet and anticoagulation. His A1C was down to 5.8, which was remarkable. And in fact, on one month follow-up, his SFA that I'd open is still open. You can see good flow all the way down. And most importantly, his amputation site healed. So he did heal an amputation site, despite what two other vascular specialists said. He did keep his leg. Um, clearly, he's not out of the woods. He is still a smoker. And we've had conversation after conversation, even after this, saying, we're going to be in trouble if we don't um, fix this. Now, that said, we offer to help. Smoking cessation aids, Chantix, all these things. You're not in it alone. It is a team approach where the patient is part of that team. I'll give an example of uh, what Dr. Garden was talking about in terms of ABIs. Um, you have to be very careful about below ankle disease. So here's a, one of my favorite patients of all time. He had a heel ulcer. But actually, if you did an ABI, the dorsalis pedis, he's got blood flow to his dorsalis pedis. So his ABIs may be okay in the anterior circulation, but he's got almost no blood flow to his heel. And so what we do is we actually ignore the ABIs and say, well, it doesn't matter. His, heel, his ulcer is on the heel. And so that's what we have to open up. And you can see we restore three vessel runoff with hyperemic flow to his heel now, where before he had nothing. And obviously he went on to, to heal this ulcer very nicely. Additionally, some of the more um, advanced uh, vascular limb salvage experts in the country are offering this procedure. I'm happy to be one of the first ones in, in the region uh, to do this and do, um, so I think, the most at this point, um, along with many other people that are helping me along the way, no question. It's a team approach. Um, this is for patients with no option CLI, so to, so, to, so to speak. So in other words, their arteries are so bad, there's nothing to offer them. Well, what we can do is actually turn their veins into arteries and basically do an in situ, minimally invasive um, surgical bypass um, only without the surgery. And so this is an ex example of a patient I recently treated. This is my a sheath that's actually in the bottom of his foot, the plantar surface of his foot. And I was able to redirect flow from his arteries to his veins and where he had almost no flow going to his foot. At the end, you can see all this blood flow through the veins all the way to his foot. And this is a, called a deep venous arterialization. Um, and this may be for patients who, have, who are on their way to amputation, no other, no other options, and this may be a way to save them. So the question is, you know, when to refer? Obviously, Dr. Garden says, you know, this has to be day one. Um, certainly patients with claudication and rest pain we worry about, but clearly patients with ischemic wounds, patients who can't heal their wounds have got to be seen um, by people who are expert in this. Again, doesn't have to be me, but someone who's really dedicated to limb salvage. The other thing we actually did not get into is don't forget you have venous ulcers. And in fact, that first, uh, that joint patient that Dr. Garten and I shared, you know, the anterior shin is a very good location for venous disease. And so if she didn't heal with arterial intervention alone, we certainly would evaluate her for venous insufficiency, which may need to be treated because a lot of these patients have mixed disease, you know, and some common signs, varicose veins, venous stasis ulcers, edema, prior DVT, patients with perimalleolar ulcers around their ankle. And again, be aware of mixed disease, patients who have both and need to be treated by both. Um, and again, this is something you have to be able to offer your patients if you're a vascular limb salvage expert. The final plug I'll say is there are studies, you know, all this um, kumbaya multidisciplinary approach is all well and good, but actually there are studies that show that a multidisciplinary team approach that includes wound care experts, um, limb salvage experts actually reduces amputation. And as Dr. Garten says, Amputation is a form, is a risk for mortality. And so literally a multidisciplinary team approach can save lives. And it really should look like this. So I really appreciate everyone's attention. We actually are a little bit early. Um, so I would be happy to uh, answer any questions. Dr. Gardner would have you to answer any questions um, if anyone has. You can either say them or type them in the little chat box here. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Lesney. Thank you, Dr. Garten, for that insightful presentation. So as Dr. Lesney just mentioned, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them into the chat box feature, and we will go ahead and read them aloud. Or if you would like to ask your question, we can go ahead and just click raise hand. And from there, I can unmute you so you can ask the question live. So 
So we'll go ahead and give it a few minutes for you guys to gather your questions. Uh, Dr. Lesney, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you a question. Uh, hey. what, what percentage of the time do you have a patient that has mixed disease? Obviously our, yeah. our, the patient's arterial supply, uh, supply was our number one concern. And clearly that, that case that we shared had venous disease as well. Um, but what percentage of time is it a mixed disease uh, wound you say? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Obviously, you're a little biased by your referral base, um, sort of, you know, what patients get sent to you. But um, I think at least we have 20% that have mixed disease. Now, that doesn't mean you have to treat both. There are times where I see a patient who, you know, clearly has venous insufficiency, clearly has arterial insufficiency, but the venous is the predominant factor or the arterial is the predominant factor. Um, but, but it is not uncommon uh, by any stretch of the imagination. All right, so it looks like we did receive one question in so far. So the question is, is there any literature or research about the improved quality of life patients experience as a result of the intervention? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, and I'll actually take it the other way. Unfortunately, there is quite a bit of literature regarding the poor quality of life after an amputation. Um, and in fact, you know, when we look at critical ischemia at one year, the majority, over 50% of patients who have critical ischemia are either dead or have an amputation. And we know amputation is an independent risk factor for decreased quality of life, decreased um, independent living. And so, you know, an intervention that can save a patient's limb absolutely sets them in the path toward more independence, better quality of life. And all our wound care experts on the line right here, I mean, they know this better than anyone. And I'll just add to that, Dr. Lesney, um, this is not research-based, this is just more my personal experience uh, work, working with so many wound patients. Um, I would say, you know, 80 to 90% of them have a documented history of depression or anxiety. And so that's something important to uh, work with the primary care doctor or refer again, you know, to uh, someone to help with that. Because these patients have had these wounds, you know, by the time they end up seeing me and Dr. Leslie, oftentimes these wounds have been present for months, if not years. And for most part, a lot of times you have to uh, really talk to them that there is a possibility we could heal your wound. It's going to take the true team effort. But for the most part, a lot of these patients have given up. They've had them for so long, they never feel like they're going to actually heal these wounds. So uh, there is a huge psychological component that goes along with this. So if we can heal these wounds, um, I really, the quality of life is, is you know, is vital to just enjoying your life. So uh, I do feel like we play a large role in that for these patients. Such a good point. Thank you both. We'll go ahead and give it another minute or so for any other last minute questions. If there's anything that comes to mind later on, Dr. Lesney and Dr. Garten do have their contact information here listed on this slide. So feel free to reach out to them with any of your specific questions. And while we're waiting, uh, Dr. Garten, let me ask you this. Um, can you tell me where skin substitutes and biologics fit in and sort of insurance hurdles for that, what patients would qualify? I know you and I have shared patients in the past where unfortunately our biggest hurdle is social or insurance. Yeah, insurance is a, a struggle for all of us, obviously, in medicine. Uh, from a skin substitute, now they call it cellular tissue products. That's the, the new uh, way of, of calling these products. Um, but Basically, when a, if a patient has had a wound present for four or more weeks and technically conservative treatment has been treated or has been attempted, uh, at that point, you can go ahead and try to get approval by the insurance for the use of one of these skin substitutes. So basically, once a wound is 100% granular, a skin substitute or negative pressure, there's a lot of things out there that would be indicated at that point, but you have to wait that time frame and then you have to get approval. Once we get approval, we have a narrow window of opportunity. In most states, you're allowed up to 10 applications in a 12-week period of time. So once that wound is granular, you really need a commitment from that patient to make sure they see you weekly and a commitment to them being compliant. Because once that 12 weeks expires, we can no longer use a skin substitute. We do have other treatment modalities as well, but my go-to currently uh, is using a skin substitute. Uh, so just to share with the audience too, from a vascular standpoint, um, so we have vein clinics. And even though there was a study recently shown that early treatment of venous insufficiency in patients who have venous stasis ulcers improves outcomes, early treatment improves outcomes. There are many insurance companies that make us wait three months 
before we can treat veins, uh, even in the setting of a documented patient with insufficiency um, before they'll cover it, which again, makes zero sense. And so, but that is a hurdle we run into where we see a patient, they have venous insufficiency, they clearly need it treated. We have to compress them for three months before we can do anything, um, which is, you know, insanity. All right, so I don't see any other questions coming in through the line now. So again, thank you to Dr. Garten. Thank you, Dr. Lesney, for taking the time today to really present this information to everyone. For those on the line, if you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to them directly, and they will be more than happy to work with you and answer any sort of patient questions that you may have. A copy of this recording will be made available and will be emailed out to you after this presentation, so be on the lookout for that. Again, thank you both so much for joining us today. Thank you, and I just want to thank Dr. Garden for her participation. Such a pleasure to have an expert here, and um, everyone for attending. Thank you for your time. I know time is precious nowadays, so I appreciate thank it, everyone. Everybody. Yeah, what y'all do, too. Please connect with us if you have any questions. We're all here to work together as a team. All right, thanks, all. All right, have a good day. take care.